Great job, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, we're preparing for our next panel. It's going to be, uh, we hope it's going to be a good and informational session for you. Uh, the title of the panel is going to be uh, Software's Role in an Open Hardware Ecosystem. Now, moderating this panel is going to be no stranger to the software world. Uh, many of you know him as Jim Zimlin. I call him Jay-Z. Uh, not, not Beyonce's Jay-Z, but the other Jay-Z, the, the lesser known Jay-Z. Uh, well, please welcome to the stage, Jim Zimlin. Thanks for having me. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to have our uh, panel come on out, and uh, I will uh, introduce them. Uh, so come on out, folks. We've got uh, a little parade come out here. So we've got Mark Shuttleworth from uh, Canonical, Mark Shaw from Microsoft, we've got uh, John Linville here from Red Hat, Dave Peterson from HPE, Heather Kirksey from the OPNFV project, and David Dale from NetApp. Welcome. So, wow, full house today. So I want to do a quick survey before we get started here. How many people in the audience right now would consider themselves hardware people? Get a quick raise of hands. And how many would consider themselves software people? Yeah, so not too bad, but a little more skewed towards the hardware side. Uh, uh, obviously, we're at an OCP event here. But the panel today, we want to talk about uh, software and how it interacts with a, a hardware uh, open ecosystem like OCP. And I want to uh, start, maybe I'll start down uh, at the other end uh, here. And, and the first question I want to ask is, is really the generic one, which is, you got a bunch of folks out here who are working on really cool hardware. I mean, we saw this morning some, some incredible stuff coming out. Uh, from a software perspective, what advice would you give these folks in terms of how your software can work better on their hardware, how you can innovate faster on top of their hardware, et cetera? So why don't I start down there, and we'll end with a bang with, uh, with Mark. Okay, um, I, think, I think cycle time is, is such a big thing with hardware development. Um, and the second thing is um, there's got to be some consistency in, in, in swapping from one component to another component type as we qual. Um, and as much as the, the industry can do to, to move faster and to have kind of a commonality for software to qual onto, um, the easier it's going to be to grow as fast as it should grow. Um, so, you know, I would say engagement, I think, with the, with the software folks. Um, so, I'm not sure how many of you famil are familiar with uh, OPNFE. It's an open source initiative around transforming, uh, especially the carrier networks, to be uh, more software oriented as opposed to the old. Uh, proprietary uh, network elements. And you know, one of the things that we do within our project is we bring in a lot of hardware. We've started bringing in uh, OCP recently. And we actually auto-deploy sort of what is becoming the next-gen telecom net uh, software networking stack on it. And that way, we're able to look at interop issues. We're able to see that the carriers, the end customers, are getting what they want out of it. And so the more engagement that we get, the more that we are able to you know, try out the software on the hardware, the more insight and, and back and forth that we can do between both the software and the hardware communities. Yep. And I want to come back to networking in a minute, but I want to hear what, what advice you have for how your software can run more effectively on OCP hardware. So we are the, one of the OCP hardware vendors, right? We, we provide it. So for us, it's a partnership that we need to have with those ISVs uh, to make sure that our hardware, their software compatible, it works well, that there's confidence in the community that when they put those two together, uh, that it works properly. Right, right. You're on both sides of the fence. Uh, I, I, I get to sit on both sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. John, well, well, you're at Red Hat, so you know, you're, you're working strictly on the software side. Well, that's right. Well, engagement is key. Engage the community, uh, get us involved. Uh, it's not hard to find the Linux community who are out there. <laughs> um, post the mailing list, uh, come to the conference, talk to people, make connections. Um, you know, your hardware is useless without some software, right? It's just, a, uh, it's basically just modern art. Um, and so... Uh, Thanks for not saying both <laughs> by the way. <laughs> well, you know, I'm sure you all have your own software people, but sometimes, you know, the broader the community, the better the ideas. 
So, you know, send us some email, you know, give us an idea of what's going on. Pick your favorite kernel developer and uh, let us know what you're doing. Yeah, send me some email. I'm not hard to find. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How about at Microsoft? Yeah, so at Microsoft, we're, we're not a hardware provider, but we, we consume hardware. We're building the cloud, that sort of thing. And so for us, consistency across the platform is key. So with our, um, with our project Olympus, uh, that, that we've built up, we can, uh, you know, we can build up standards. We build up standards that are easy, they're, they're secure, they're able to uh, um, be used by anybody. And we want uh, the entire community to use it. And then you can build pieces on top of it. So just like how you do open source software, you do open source hardware. You build the modules on top. And uh, you know, I think some of the things that you know, the hardware is, is the base, but the firmware that goes on top of it is what really gets exposed to the software. Right. And uh, so things like OpenBMC initiatives that are um, uh, running through Open Compute, um, those those are key. You know, those types of initiatives and, and going forward in the uh, in the management interfaces are are also key. Yeah, we we talked a little bit about this consistency. So I, yeah. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Mark. Um, so the, the interesting part for me is just how decoupling software and hardware actually makes life better for, for both groups, right? Your software innovators can go faster knowing that, that the people buying hardware are going to have some flexibility and choice, and the hardware innovators can go faster you know, with, their, with their innovation. And, and as an OS, we're uh, right in the middle of those two layers, right? Our job is essentially to provide a very clean coupling so that software innovators and hardware innovators can, can, can come together. So I think the really interesting thing for me is as, as the pace of innovation in hardware continues to accelerate, there is incredible stuff coming out of all of the major players. Uh, Intel, we saw ARM, we've seen power. Right? How can we um, shorten the time to value for everybody so that software innovation can grab that hardware innovation and be real? Right? It's not real until you have an app using it, right? right. And, and how can we tighten that window? I think OCP is playing a great, sort of is opening up the door for us to really change the game there. It, but it, let, let me dive down a little bit into the consistency question that, that you all brought up. I'd love to hear from everyone on this is, you know, OCP six years in here and, you know, we hear on the software side about need for consistency. I hear a lot about firmware all the time. What what is it? Why isn't it? Why isn't this happening faster? Why aren't we seeing more consistency? Are, are, do you feel hopeful about it? Uh, I'll start with you, Mark, and we can hear from everyone. Well, so partly there's a slightly kind of delicious throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? The, the industry had a whole bunch of sort of processes to validate and provide, present consistency, which we kind of gaily threw out the window in the first round of OCP, I think, right? And now people are, are appreciating the value of potentially some of those, those industrial processes. Right. And we, what we have to figure out is an open approach to creating that same sort of standardization. One way will simply be adopting common code. So things like OpenBMC are interesting because potentially we don't need a standards process if everyone's using the same open source code and there's some sort of release process around that, right? It's effectively a standard and a very efficient way of writing one. Um, so, so essentially this is now, the door is open for us to find a new way to create that consistency of the interface. Um, so, uh, with the project Olympus, you know, trying to trying to get that consistency. What what we've done is, you know, when you look at, I should say, when we look at hardware development cycles, they take a year and a half, sometimes two years, a long time, and so it's really hard to get fast iterations and, and changes when it takes that length of time. So, for example, you know, about halfway through our project Olympus, you know, last last year, we uh, we brought that to the OCP community, started publishing our specs for universal motherboards and things like that. And, and what we've seen is the community respond. You know, we've seen, uh, you know, the, we, we have our base system, but then, then uh, you know, AMD came forth and Cavium and Qualcomm all came forth. So, so we have one specification with uh, standardization for management, standardization for I.O. And, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and one spec that covers actually four different CPU vendors um, to create consistency, and that's the, that's the very first time that's ever happened at Open Compute. Right, which is a big milestone. That's yeah, right. it's yeah. huge. John, how about so, you? So, well, we mentioned consistency, following standards, sticking to standards. One problem with that, of course, is if you stick to a standard, it's hard to innovate. You just produce what was in the standard, that's not really innovation. So, while you're innovating on top of the standard, 
talk to people. Tell us what you're doing. Tell us why it's great. And make sure people are aware of it and what you actually have in mind that it can be done with. You know, sometimes you say, here, here's this, we changed the green light to red light. We have no idea why is red better than green, right? <laughs> so you have to kind of tell us, well, what was the thinking? Um, but, you know, that's just being part of the community, being, uh, being here, being at the Linux Foundation events or, or, or whatnot, uh, talking to people, doing presentations, just communicating, you know, that's, so that's what they say in the military, move, shoot, and communicate, right? So <laughs> that's the third part, is, is communicate, so. And how, how uh, so one question I get all the time from, from these communities is, how welcoming is the kernel community <laughs> to uh, accepting you well, know, it, uh, code and, you it, know. That kind of depends. It, it bears some observation of the community before you jump in. <laughs> so uh, they react better to, uh, to people who kind of act in an appropriate fashion, shall we say. Um, uh, don't just come in and say, here, I've done the greatest thing and take it. That's usually not going to be very well received. Uh, in fact, generally the best thing is, I've kind of got this idea and I'm thinking I'm going to do this and here's a patch. And then you get, no, no, that's stupid. And, and somebody else will come along and they'll write 10 other patches and, and, <laughs> and whatever else. It's usually the best way to, to interact. Um, it's a little foreign just to people who aren't involved uh, with, with Linux for a while, but that's usually the best way to go about it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So t today, consistency really looks a lot more like interoperability, right? It's less about hardware consistency and it's more about that OpEx, DevOps kind of mentality of how do I interoperate against vendor A, vendor B, vendor C in my data center? And so that, you know, that's, that's where we are today open hardware is there, but it's not really universal, right? As Mark was talking about with Project Olympus, a beautiful concept, but it's not reality across. Heck, as, mo as motherboard manufacturers, as ODMs, as OEMs, we don't even have consistency about motherboard mounting holes, right? So <laughs> We do in Project Olympus. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> so, right? The, and, and we've begun that process, but truly universal hardware is going to take some very small building blocks to get there before we can even get to this uh, consistency and universality of hardware. We need that, but we're not there yet. So, given the length of the production cycles, how do, how do you iterate? You know, in software, you, you, you're releasing a new kernel every three months, right? Yeah. How do you do that iteration process? What are some ideas around around? That? <laughs> ideas around it. Yeah. We, we, we've done a lot of things. So I, I represent the Cloudline family inside of the HPE uh, product portfolio. And we've done some things from a development standpoint to really shorten the life cycle of a from concept to delivery to the end customer. That doesn't shorten it to three months, never will. But there's certainly some things from a design and a development standpoint that, that the industry can do, right? And that I believe we can bring to the table to help uh, this community to, to accelerate the pace of hardware development. There are also some really good initiatives here in OCP to open up the tool chain for the design process. Yes. So there's a group here led by, I think, uh, Splitter Desktop, um, who are making open source tools to essentially allow people to collaborate around the designs of the physicality in a way that we, we have long had open source tools. And you remember the, the crisis that gave birth to Git right. and just how seminal that was in opening up effectively and accelerating collaboration around software. Right. I think we see the same stuff happening uh, in, in hardware form factors and it's happening right here. Interesting. Heather, how about at OPN if you... Yeah, so I mean, we actually see a lot of the consistency um, and interoperability issues. Um, we have 16 worldwide community labs where hardware manufacturers bring in their gear and then we deploy various you know, open source software stacks uh, on them. And it, it's amazing, actually. I mean, you would think some basic stuff might be there, but just even around configuration uh, is where we've found a lot of issues, too, um, around setting up things like your, your uh, open stack networks. Um, the expectations of things like the NICs around how you're going to do that uh, vary, very wildly. Um, you know, full, I would say about fully half the sort of development and debugging time of our very first software release was around just trying to get the release to deploy reliably just on two different hardware manufacturers. Um, and that was, they were both x86, we weren't even yet trying to bring in different hardware architectures. And so just even sort of just, I mean, that took like three months um, to be able to figure out how to get OpenStack set up reliably on uh, two different hardware manufacturers. So it's something that we're sort of, you know, experiencing and down in the weeds on it's part of the reason we have our, our labs with so many different things. But 
maturity kind of brings consistency at a certain time. Like the more nascent you are, the less, you know, people are all assuming different things and doing things different ways. And so maturity has brought it also figuring out things like common configuration files, doing a lot of porting work within the community. We've, we've now got much more of a handle on it for someone who brings in something new. Interesting. Dave, what, what's your perspective? Um, I, I think uh, for, for OCP, um, success is going to be when there are tons and tons of uh, a wide range of software packages that just run on the infrastructure. The barrier to that is qual time for all of those vendors. Consistency is the solution to the qual time issue. It's as simple as that, I think. Well, so I'm going to turn that uh, that answer back on you because I, I, you're an interesting, you know, you're a company that has both software and hardware. And I remember, not your organization, but speaking to an executive once who said, you know, there's OCP and it's open source hardware, and then there's SDN and that's abstracting and commoditizing hardware. And, you know, how do I respond to that? And mm -hmm. you know, my answer was, well, yes, that's right. You know, sort of hardware is being certain to software, it's being commoditized. But then there's open source, which is also commoditizing software. So you're doubly screwed. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. For a company like NetApp, who's both uh, in the software and the hardware business, like what company are you? Where do you, where do you see yeah, it's, it's, organizations adding value? Yeah, it's confusing. It looks like a hardware company from the products we sell. Uh, we started 25 years ago. We thought of ourselves as a software company even way back then, mm. who, in, who coincidentally had to, to deliver a solution, had to invent some hardware. As time's gone on, um, we've had to invent less and less hardware. So today, when we are package our software into an appliance, the hardware piece is, is pretty much all ODM. It's off-the-shelf comp components from a big distributor with no specials. And we, we've actually taken it to heart that it really is a software-defined storage set of solutions we have and embrace white boxes, embrace the cloud. You can buy a version that will run in Amazon. Um, OCP is a very interesting target for us as you know, another large um, adjacent market for us that's got the potential for huge growth. Right. So we, we think of ourselves as software, even though most of the world probably assumes that we're hardware. So, so there's a really counterintuitive thing in economics that explains why at the outskirts of town you'll find this sort of stretch of highway where all of the car dealerships line up right next to each other and sell cars. You know, you'd think that they would each want to stake out a territory so that people could come to them and then they'd kind of monopolize their time and attention. But actually it's been shown again and again that everybody sells more when all the dealerships are right next to each other. And it has to do ultimately with the speed of the buying decision, right? People know that they can just go there. They don't know what car they want to buy. They just know they want to buy a car. So they can go there and evaluate all the cars really efficiently. And so if you think about that in the context of server hardware or any other kind of hardware as the mission of OCP expands, um, there is this temptation when you have very large organizations investing in things that they want to differentiate on, right, to also try to set up the dealership somewhere where they can monopolize people's attention. But actually, the fact that we have things like Project Olympus, which are going to allow people to simply make decisions faster about what's right for them, will raise the bar for everybody, right? Um, Heather's story about taking three months just to be able to get stuff working, if you think about that from a buy cycle point of view, what's that doing? It's three months of friction before somebody places a PO, and it's better for everybody to get rid of that friction. Yeah. I, I, I want to talk. I want to come back to networking a little bit because there's a lot of excitement going on in the networking stack. I mean, you know, all the way from you know management and orchestration down to data plane services. It, it, I, we, we've got projects, uh, IO Visor, FDIO, DPDK. I mean, there's just a ton of activity happening in network. A huge transformation happening in global operator networks and data center networks. G give me your perspectives on what folks at OCP should be thinking about when it comes to networking, in particular how software interacts with uh, the hardware in that sector. I'll start with Mark. So what I have visibility on at the moment is that we've reached the point of disaggregation where you can genuinely evaluate and implement the networking stack from Facebook, from Microsoft, the Sonic project that Kushagra talked about earlier, uh, and, and disruptors like Snaproot, who are coming out of the Apple data center and bringing that competence into the market effectively, and, and you'll see other sort of brands coming in as well. Those are now literally just apps on top of Ubuntu, on top of a switch. And so you can evaluate them and test them and you know, 
drive them hard and then make a decision effectively really, really cheaply because of that disaggregation. Um, and I think the next wave of that is that we'll start to see an ecosystem form of non-switching apps that run really amazingly well when you put them on a switch, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a whole new class of compute, not just to kind of make switching better, but to do all the other sorts of functions that you might want to do on a switch, right? Just because it's the one thing in the rack that can talk to everything in the rack at the same speed, right? And that's pretty exciting. I think we're just at the beginning, we're kind of the, the, at the maturation point of the disaggregation of software and hardware and switches, and therefore we're at the starting point of the opening up and the sort of innovation point um, uh, and, and that's going to be to the benefit of all of those players, right? Because they will suddenly have innovators left and right that make their propositions look much more exciting. Yeah. How about at Microsoft? What's your perspective? Yeah, so, so, so the thing about networking is that it's transitioning. It is the, the rapid rate of innovation is just, is just tremendous. So we, you know, it wasn't very long ago we were completely on one gig. You know, it's one gig, now it's 10 gig, now it's 40 gig. 50 gig is, is here today. You know, there's going to be 100 gig just down the road, 200 gig. These things are all happening in a very short period of time. And so what that's done is that's brought in lots of different vendors, you know, bringing in their technology. And the, the attempt to adopt that hardware is, is very difficult. And so the initiatives, you know, things like Sonic, our contributions to Sonic, have made it so that we can utilize these different vendor switches bring them in, and boom, they work. We don't have to worry about, oh, now we have to recode to a new API and, and that sort of thing. And so from our perspective, um, getting to, you know, the, to those, those interfaces where you can, you know, you could even put, you know, different apps on top if, if you need to, but getting, getting to that point where you have the standardized interfaces is, is helping us to bring forth the rate of innovation much more quickly than we could have otherwise. Right, right. Well, so the OCP networking stuff is, is amazing. Um, the, the, the advancement of white box switches, it's a really cool uh, concept. It's actually something that in my career, even before I joined Red Hat, it was something that I kind of advocated when it was completely unquestionable. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, uh, Mark's right, the, 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 the uh, potential for innovation, you know, you put that white box switch at the top of the rack, uh, running an, you know, an off-the-shelf you know, Linux, Ubuntu, Red Hat, whatever, or e even a, any other kind of operating system, but you can position apps there that because of the, the, their, their geographic location, shall we say, uh, can just perform so much better at the top of the rack, uh, you know, f f um, solving thundering herd kind of uh, 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 you know, boot time, you, know, you flip the switch on the rack and everything comes up at the same time. Um, you know, it's just great stuff. Um, one thing, uh, and, and you know, the things like the SAI uh, initiative has been, you know, great that it's opened this up and, and made this po possibility for the white box switches. Now, I think there's still a road to go there uh, in terms of uh, having fully open source uh, all the way to the switch vendors API. Um, and not many switch vendors are, have, uh, are, they're just downright intransigent there, uh, certain ones. And, uh, now I will uh, point out Mellanox as their support for the switch dev right. API that's gone into the Linux kernel. As, uh, it's great stuff. Uh, they hired Yuri Perko to, to push that. Um, certainly wish him great luck with that and I hope that that uh, uh, you know, becomes something that is very successful for them. Uh, and I hope that the, the other switch vendors will consider uh, you know, pushing that. So now I'll get off my soapbox a little bit and say, you know, let's open source your code, but, uh, you know, it's good work so far. Well, so I'll ask <laughs> HPE this question. I mean, you know, you heard John. Is it, is it better to be at the table than on the menu here? I mean, is it? <laughs> Much better to be at the table, absolutely. <laughs> it, to, to me, the, the perspective we have, right, we all live in the data center, right? And that, so from a switching and networking standpoint, being in the data center, and that's what we're talking about here. But I think we have to all look at what's going on outside the data center, what's going on in the, in the environment, right? In the community. And that is things like autonomous vehicles, right? Whether that's a, a, a car or a drone. And you think about the latency and the bandwidth that's needed. And so not only is networking inside the data center going to be important, but how do we then connect and, and get the IT gear to the right places so that autonomous vehicles or whatever else is next coming down the path for us uh, is possible. So we've got to embrace both sides of that, right? Not just the compute side, but storage and the networking gear as well. 
Heather, what, what is the OPNFV wish list for OCP when it comes to networking? Do you have a? Um, well, I mean, for us, actually, you know, because we, we are looking at that broader picture, right, it, it's not just sort of data center networking. It's the carriers looking at their network being made up of, of data centers and what they're you know, looking to do with that. You know, I, I think it's really just sort of understand the, the types of workloads uh, that the service providers are wanting to do. You know, when you're trying to you know, recreate something like a core router in that level of throughput um, you know, from a you know, sort of pool uh, of white box, um, you know, not proprietary integrated stuff that was designed just for that, um, you know, just thinking about, you know, some, some workloads that are perhaps not what you've been thinking about so far, or just ensuring that, you know, if this is running the internet, you know, that it's, it's there and it, it, it can do it. Um, you know, and then on the, the flip side, I think for people like the, the carriers who are going through this transformation, you know, for so long they have thought about boxes and boxes equaling a function. And for them to start thinking of, you know, it's, it's both OCP, it's cloud, you know, it's all these innovations that, you know, what can you, how can you start thinking about a really cool service if that stuff isn't there, you know, and your business isn't being a plumber anymore, your business is enabling architects to build really cool houses on top of the, you know, plumbing infrastructure that you've, you've got, you know, and so, you know, just enabling that, that wide innovation that you haven't even thought of yet. Um, is what I, I get really excited about when I think about sort of network transformation. All right, well, I, I want to I ask one final question. So it's 2017. What is your wish list for this year for OCP? I want to give each of you sort of a last word on, you know, we got about a few minutes left here, 30 seconds on, you know, what, what, what do you see as the big challenges for OCP? What would you like to see out of this project from a software perspective? Um, I'd like to see a big growth in software available called on OCP hardware, just as a stake in the ground and move forward. Um, um, I think that's really important for the project, and um, I think that will help OCP deliver on the promise that that, that, that it's been um, that it's been talking about for a while. That, that sounds like a commitment from NetApp. To, to do some of that work. <laughs> <laughs> Not being a lawyer. All right, I'll come back to, I'll come back to Mark. How about you? Um, I, I'd really like to see this all come together in, um, in, in a world where the data center runs itself. Um, and so just as a sneak preview of that, this afternoon um, I'll be showing some work with, that we've done together with the Sonic team, which essentially brings together automation of the compute and storage side of the rack with automation of the top of rack side, right? And so it's in the context of Sonic. And really it's about saying, how can we get to a world where racks can come in the door, they get plugged in, and within 20 minutes, everything in that rack is fully inventory. It could be a Cavian surf server in an Olympus sled, it could be x86, whatever it is has been inventoried and is already being assigned to that portfolio of workloads, right? The, the next big step is to tie all of this together uh, to the point where the data center runs itself and everybody can focus on the layers above. Then, right. we've, then we've really achieved, I think, what OCP set out to do. Right. Yeah, th there's a tremendous amount of exciting technology coming through OCP, you know, with different server boards, accelerators, storage, networking. Um, what I think OCP's challenge challenge that they're working very hard on is to get that so that in the hands of end customers. So end customers can buy machines, they can have the, 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 the comfort and the, the knowledge that it won't take them three months just to get the operating system booted, you know? So that, so that it's, it's certified and secure and reliable. And, uh, and so, you know, I guess my vision is that, you know, anybody out there who wants to buy OCP hardware can buy it, bring it in, turn it on, Boom, it, it works. Metal as a service. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Heard that somewhere. Right. John, how about you? Well, you know, um, my initial involvement with OCP, I came to some of the first events. Uh, I walked away thinking, well, this is cool and all, but it's mostly about building, you know, vanity free PCs, you know, 21 inch racks, 48 volt bus bars, yada, 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 whatever. But it's all going to run rail. It's all just going to boot. It's all just going to work. 
And so I didn't really, I was kind of like, I'm, why am I here? You know, I was Admiral Stockdale, <laughs> who am I? Why am I here? Um, but, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, it, it, the, the, the project has matured and expanded. They're doing lots of cool stuff. There's lots of software initiatives. Uh, and so I guess you ask, what, what do I want to see? I want to see more of that. I want to see it continue. I want to see, uh, you know, let's see Red Hat in some of these project descriptions and uh, but let's, uh, let's get out there and uh, let's do something. And, uh, you know, so more of the same, I think, is, is the big thing for me. Got it. So in the spirit of the drive towards uh, universality, right, that, that we've talked about, interoperability is the short-term goal. And to me, it, what I'd love to see is a, an official adoption of a Redfish spec for the OCP community. Uh, and implementation of Redfish across the IT gear that comes into uh, the OCP community and is deployed by the different OXMs uh, by the end of this year so that we can truly start to have that uh, universal interoperability first as we get to that true universality down the line. Yeah, last word to Heather. Bring your gear, we'd like to test on it. All right, <laughs> and then, then I, I, I faked out, actually I want to have the last word, which is, you know, the Linux Foundation projects, whether it's OpenSwitch or projects that Heather runs like OPNFV or m many of the, the projects we have, I've been working with Corey and the crew from OCP to make sure that our projects work hand in hand with OCP to make sure that we get that software enabled on this hardware. It's something we've been working on, we're going to kick it off even harder uh, after this event. So we look forward to a really good year with all of you. And with that, I'll thank our panel and thank all of you.